Welcome everybody who are just starting to join us. We'll be starting in just about one minute, giving everyone time to settle into today's discussion. Everybody, we're about to get started. We're gonna give another 30 seconds. We've got a lot of folks who are just trickling in here, so we'll give them another few seconds. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, and thanks for joining us. It is May 6, 2021, and today's What About Us? A sleep health discussion with and for healthcare providers is our seventh episode of the Solving for Sleep series and the series finale. So this year-long series has been made possible through PCDC's partnership with the SAMHSA Center of Excellence for Integrated Health Solutions. And we thank them and you for your support in this series. If, uh, and we can head to the next slide there. If this is your first time joining us, I am Andrew Phillip, a clinical health psychologist and the clinical lead and senior director for partnerships here at the Primary Care Development Corporation. Next slide, please. And so PCDC is a national nonprofit. We were founded over 20 years ago to enhance health equity in underserved and frankly disinvested communities. And since 1993, we've been doing this through capital investment to the tune of over $1.2 billion to enhance healthcare infrastructure around the country through advocacy and research to support policies that foster enhanced and sustainable primary care services where they're needed most and through training and technical assistance like today's discussion as well as consultation on everything from uh, patient-centered medical home accreditation to primary care and behavioral health integration, HIV prevention, care management, quality improvement and more. Uh, next slide, please. So just our usual quick disclaimer, uh, the views discussed today and throughout the series are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the uh, Center for, Men for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, Health and Human Services, or any other federal entity. Next slide, please. So uh, let, let's hop to it here. Uh, so throughout the series, uh, We've set out to really further an international movement, one of integrating physical and behavioral health to really ensure access to services and a range of services that is whole person that takes a biopsychosocial approach. So this year we've been looking at integration through the surprisingly complex lens of sleep. We've been looking at the impacts of sleep on mood, um, on medical conditions, and overall well being the roles of care teams and listening to and, and really partnering with patients to enhance sleep health, all the while developing a really core set of skills uh, in, this, in this area. So, uh, and we can head to the next slide. Uh, this is an interesting time for us. Earlier this year, uh, we reviewed the foundational components of sleep health uh, back in December, as you see here. We heard from researchers, from healthcare leaders on important topics and steps to really address health disparities in sleep and access. We reviewed the medical and behavioral assessment and treatment methods for sleep-related conditions, things like uh, insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea. We also got to hear from a panel of folks sharing their own experiences as patients in receiving treatment and, and seeking treatment for sleep-related disorders. So, 
throughout the series, many of you actually, the professionals and the experts in our audiences, you've shared your own experiences often through the chat. Uh, and no surprise to us, but it's not frequently discussed. As healthcare providers, we actually have little, if any, immunity to the same types of sleep conditions that our patients face. And we've spent this year talking about how poor sleep can impact all these different areas. Um, but for those of us who are in caregiver roles, it also takes a unique toll. And so as we'll hear about today, poor sleep it can impact things like medical errors, but also burnout and professional exhaustion at a time where our services are so sorely needed. So today we're flipping the lens and asking, what about us? Uh, who's caring for the sleep needs of interdisciplinary health teams and staff? And when did we stop becoming deserving of our own medicine? Is there anything that we can do? Uh, and of course the answer is yes. Uh, so we have 90 minutes today and I'm gonna guide us through a live and unscripted discussion with two incredible guests, both with unique perspectives on the health of healthcare professionals. Uh, we'll spend about half an hour with each of them. And throughout the discussion, I'm really gonna look to you, uh, those folks in the audience through your uh, chat there um, to share your thoughts and ask questions of our guests. Uh, today's session is being recorded. Uh, it will be available on our website at pcdc.org slash sleep in the next few days, along with all of the other episodes of this year's series. Um, so next slide. Uh, so before I introduce our first guest, uh, I'd like to hear uh, about you. Uh, so let us know what type of setting you work in. Um, do you consider yourself primarily from a primary care background or behavioral health? Really, where do you work? Perhaps an integrated care setting? Uh, and um, do you primarily work as a, as a physician, an MD, a DO, um, a nurse, a medical assistant, a social worker, care manager, or something else? And we're always especially interested in, in Folks who don't fall into one of our neat categories, if you're in one of these others, use the chat. Uh, and if you can select a reply to uh, panel and audience or at panel and attendees so that everybody could see and let us know where you work and, and what your background is. Uh, again, especially if you're not in one of the neat uh, clickables here. So we'll give just a few moments uh, for the poll here. Great, so we've got substance abuse prevention specialist. Excellent, welcome, good to, good to see you. And also folks, feel free to let us know what part of the country you're in and, and where you work too, so we can uh, see all who's in the audience here. And we can probably pull up the poll results as well. Great, okay, so we've got um, just about half of folks in primary care settings and then a really nice spread of um, some primary care, but uh, rather half of you in behavioral health settings, 14% in primary care, but also 32%, which is, a, I think, a growing number episode after episode in integrated care settings. And that's great to see. Um, interesting spread in the audience here, the biggest category being other. And that's what we're seeing here in the chat. So let's see, who else have we got here? Uh, executive director and also a therapist. Uh, um, we've got uh, uh, someone focused on quality and data, patient outcomes. Excellent. Nice, nice seeing you. Well-being program manager for an academic medical system. Uh, behavioral health aid, great to see you, welcome. Uh, we've got occupational therapists, we've got EAP uh, call center operators, uh, advocates for New York City housing courts, mostly for older adults, licensed psychologist, program director for shelters, excellent, great to see you. Uh, social workers, uh, nurse care managers, folks from multi-service organizations, family physician, medical director, purchaser of healthcare for public employees, interesting. Um, pro project managers, uh, uh, state psychiatric facilities, uh, school nurses. Oh, this is great. Excellent. We've got folks from all over the country. We've got folks in Texas doing psychologists at a psychiatry residency training program. Rapid Access Navigator. Okay, keep them coming. It's so great to see, very informative. Um, and I'm going to keep advancing us through, but as we go through, continue um, using the chat here. So uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, if we can advance to the next slide here, I'm gonna introduce our first guest as we continue to hear more from our guests in the audience. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Sabri. So Hala Sabri, I'm gonna share a bit of her bio here. Uh, Dr. Sabri is a board certified emergency medicine physician and also the founder of Physician Moms Group or PMG. She's also a mom of five with two sets of twins um, and, uh, you know, by her own admission, being a mother of five has given her a unique uh, expertise and skill set to really help other parents in the medical field. 
She attributes having a solid support system like physician mom group and also life coaching and helping her manage her own thoughts and reaffirm her, her why. Uh, she offers high performance coaching to professional women in a male dominated profession in a quest to fulfill their professional goals and discover the legacy they want to create in hopes of decreasing the equity gap uh, in addition, uh, Heller works with health organizations to improve their recruitment and engagement practices to include more women. She's a tenacious advocate for ending sexism and promoting gender and racial equity in the medical field. She believes that as a community leader, she has a responsibility to forge a path for other women and to elevate her fellow physician mothers. She's collaborated with leading Fortune 500 companies and international organizations to further her work and advocacy. And as we speak with Dr. Sabri, we're really gonna be thinking about what are the internal factors for us as healthcare providers related to our sleep. So uh, Dr. Hal Sabri, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you. And um, just as sort of a start, you know, I, I first uh, came across your work about a year or more ago, actually, through Physician Mom Group, and which I understand is one of the largest uh, peer support networks with over 100,000 members across 100 countries, which is incredible. Um, you know, as a psychologist uh, working usually with other medical uh, providers, one thing I've found is that we've actually got a good deal in common. And unfortunately, one of those things is that we tend to put our own needs second or maybe third or fourth. Um, so maybe we can start there. Um, so I have that question for you. So as healthcare professionals, what have you seen? Why do we tend to de-emphasize our own needs, especially around sleep? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And it's just been a pleasure working with you over multiple projects over the last year. And I just want to thank you for all the support that you lend to healthcare. Um, and just to see the diversity of those that attend that are attending today is just really, really neat to see that it's such a collaborative approach of how we could be better as providers of care to actually serve our patients better, you know, and remember we are patients too. So I think that's an important thing. Um, but I think that why is it so hard for us to prioritize ourselves and sleep and rest and, and whatnot? And I think it, it goes from just being really productive people. I think that, I mean, I can't remember a time I was thinking about this before I got on this call. Um, like since high school, I remember like making endless to-do lists and always having, you know, the impossible goal, which was like medical school and then getting through medical school and then wanting a really like competitive, you know, field that I was going to go into. And then once I got there, like I just kept building goals. Like I actually never stopped to like celebrate myself. I never stopped to really just have that rest and relaxation that I think every brain needs, you know, and I think we have that opportunity to stop every single day. You don't have to stop at big milestones, but I mean, that's what sleep is. It's stopping and resting and rejuvenating. And it's such an important part of our bodies. And we know this as clinicians, we know this as people, um, but somehow because we're so addicted to productivity, that that's the first thing that gets cut. And so I think for me, I started realizing probably about two years ago, like, hey, if I want to get anything done, I need to work on my sleep hygiene first. I need to work on my self-care first. And ever since I have been focusing on myself and my self-care, literally only then did all of my greatest dreams actually really come true, especially in my career. Yeah, I, that, I think that... Um, a lot of that resonates, it certainly resonates, uh, I'll just be honest with me, and I, I think with others, you know, um, I, I think across healthcare, we all get into this because, you know, because we care and because we want to, you know, we're kind of be healers by nature. Um, but there is this feeling of like, it's just, it, it's never quite enough. I've, I've never, I've never helped enough people. I've never quite done enough. And then even in our own careers, I think in healthcare and across the board, right? Like there's this sort of the need for achievement, as we talk about, in, in, in particularly you know in, in mental health, but um, it, it can really be pernicious in a way. Um, how do we how do we start adjusting, or how did you adjust that even? Like, how do we start changing that dialogue? How do we make sleep feel like a possibility for us? Well, I think that we have to shift our mindset that it's not a possibility, but it's actually a necessity. I mean, it's part of every single like foundation of any hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I mean, it's like sleep, shelter, food. Um, and I think that, you know, 
I think there's multiple ways that we need to go about it. One is for us as ourselves to be our own advocates and to allow ourselves to have agency and say like, hey, this is not okay. Like we're being asked to overextend ourselves beyond what is physically um, and mentally, you know, possible really. Um, and the other thing too, is that, you know, like I mentioned, like this started in high school, like this didn't start just when I became a mom or anything like that. So this is like ingrained um, in our society that we are rewarded on productivity um, and not really focusing on like the 1% goals that if everyone does the one, their 1% 1 that we're actually greater as a sum of parts than, you know, really judged by our individual um, contributions. And I think with medicine, it's really hard too, because we're trained. Um, it doesn't matter what your specialty is or what your service line is, but we're trained that patients come first. Um, and they, and they should, I'm not saying that they should not, but at the same time, we have hospitals and the healthcare system, cutting physicians, cutting nurses, cutting mental health workers, cutting all of these, we're not investing in those programs. So we're trying to meet more demands than with less people, you know? And so I think as healthcare workers, we all, like you said, Andrew, we want to help more people. Right. And if, and if anything, like not, not only is it our, in our ethos, like we want that, but also we're held to a standard that if we don't do it, we're actually penalized either by losing our job, um, not being a team player or even getting sued. You know, if you're not actually, you know, servicing everybody to the extent that they need. So I think for, um, so I think that the system has to change um, and our mindset has to change individually. I don't know which one is going to go first. It's kind of like, which came first, the chicken or the egg. But I think that if we work on it in tandem, then, you know, I think we might see some movement with time. Yeah. And when, when you, when you, when you mentioned, uh, you know, even sort of, uh, the need to make sure and, and sometimes fear that we're not doing enough for our patients. Uh, gosh, I think of like certainly nights and um, something tells me you've been watching the folks uh, in the chat here. Um, you know, a lot of us have probably stayed up at, at least a few nights wondering about the health, the, the lives of our patients, you know, wondering, you know, did I, did I, did I, did I do enough? Um, did I, did I remember everything I needed to do? And, you know, behavioral health a lot of times we have concerns about, um, about, about harm, about suicide, and, and things like that for our patients and, and their well-being and their families, um, you know. But I think you know. I'm also interested in, in, and perhaps you might share a little bit about physician mom group because I imagine also for those of us who um, who have lives outside of work and outside of the clinic, um, there's stuff to deal with there too. You know, in, in your bio, uh, you know, you share um, you know being a mom as well. Um, how does that interact with? sleep and with with taking care of yourself and how do people navigate that yeah I mean as you can imagine I have five children and so um sleep is really important not only for their health but also for mine <laughs> so um you know I think you know I, th I think when I started focusing on my sleep hygiene like I started realizing that the best example of norms that I can teach my children is what I'm going to do for myself and so for me, it was actually quite easy. Like, I, I think a lot of people, they'll look at me and they'll say like, I mean, how do you do it all? You know, but it's actually just routine. And what does it come down to really? It's like, just really focusing on your priorities, making sure they're, you know, met every single day, including sleep self-care. Um, but I think that, um, but I think with physician moms group, I will tell you, I mean, I'm just one person and I represent like you know, over 115,000 people, I will say, especially in this last year, it's been really, really difficult. Um, because I think that in healthcare, whether you're a woman or man, um, I think that we play multiple roles in our family. You know, I think that we obviously, we are in charge of our patients, and there, our work is never done. You know, this is not a field that has a nine to five that you go home, and your work is left at work. Um, in fact, as being a physician, it's even, you know, demanded that like say like you're on an airplane you're in a restaurant obviously we're not a lot of us are not in restaurants right now but you know if there's an emergency they're not asking for a non-healthcare professional or they're like where's a doctor where's a nurse where's you know first responder um so if anything like we're always on call you know um all of us and you know we have laws that say that we have to like help right so so we're always on call um but i think that 
with the pandemic, especially what was happening was not only do we have this demand of our community, like leadership, if anything else, but also we were primary caretakers in our home as well. So somehow schools are shut down. Um, kids are home. It, and for, for most of us, that was not the norm before. Um, our nannies were scared of us. They didn't want to work with us. So we, a lot of us lost our help um, that, you know, our support system at home that uh, really supported us to do the work that we do. Like they're the most important people in our lives, you know, as, you know, our babysitters and nannies and uh, au pairs and everything. So, so that was taken away from us. Um, and then in addition, like we were we were scared we were going to get infected as well. I mean, many, many physicians and healthcare workers died during the pandemic. So it's like this triple threat of like, you know, this new, this new anxiety and fear. So, um, you know, we actually published data on this um, about the percentage of women uh, physicians that, you know, and what was their anxiety level before the pandemic? Because we already were, you know, doing this whole work-life balance, which I don't really believe in. I think it's more of a work-life homeostasis. But then for that to be shifted even more with adding a pandemic, I mean, none of us have lived through this kind of pandemic in our lifetime. Yeah, and this, um, you know, there, there was a, a comment in the chat as you were, uh, as you were talking a second ago, and it, it connected with what I think you just mentioned about, you know, life during the pandemic, and uh, April mm -hmm. had mentioned working, um, you know, with a specialty in postpartum and, and pregnant mothers, and just the increase in demands, especially during COVID. Um, um, and, I, you know, I can only imagine, um, like you said, with, with, with kids being home from school, and still the, the requirements as a professional being um, as intense as ever, um, again, like for you or, or for your members, I mean, have, have people been, um, how folks get, been getting through? Do they, are we changing shifts? Are we um, taking naps? Like how, how do you actually get through the day? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if I have an answer for you, but I will say that, you know, never, I mean, when I made physician moms group, I made it almost seven years ago. And what actually happened was I was pregnant with my first set of twins and I didn't, I mean, I didn't know how to balance work and life. And like I just said, I just, after seven years realized that that's never going to happen. Right. So I'm like chasing this dream that doesn't exist, but, um, but I, I made this group thinking that other women would maybe were smarter than me and had it all figured out and would just tell me the, the answers. Um, so never did I ever think that, you know, we would be facing a pandemic. And as we build the group, like my leadership and, and looking, I mean, looking at for me to me for answers, that was really hard because, you know, here I am not only having those three major hats that we were all wearing, but then all of a sudden I'm in charge of this community who's asking me for, for guidance. And I'm like, I, I, this is definitely, this was not on my bingo card for any of the years I was ever going to live, you know? So, um, I think what we started doing is one normalizing our feelings, like we're scared where, you know, the whole country is looking to us for guidance and expecting us to be the heroes that are ready and prepared. Right. I mean, emergency medicine, like this is my thing, right? Like we do mask mass casualty exercises all the time. We talk about pandemics. We talk about bioterrorism. There's a lot of things that we talk about and we prepare for, but as we're doing them, it's kind of like, this is likely not going to happen. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's there. So I think just one acknowledging that it's okay to be scared. <laughs> it's okay to be, you know, anxious about it. Um, and, and then just leaning on each other and really, really using the support group for what it was intended, you know, is in extremes of, situations to have people that you're going to lean on. So I think we just figured it out together. Um, and what we ended up doing is actually expanding our community um, because we've been kind of running a well-oiled machine for a couple of years. And so it was, you know, it was a great support, um, but, you know, the men wanted it too. So the men were like, wait, we, we don't know what we're doing either. Right. And so we, we actually made a whole COVID group that ended up supporting many physicians around the world. And what was really neat about that is not only did we get to validate the feelings, we get to support one another, but we actually got to mentor one each other, one of one, one another. Um, for example, early on in March, like we were able to get the Italian physicians in Italy to tell us what they were seeing. So we could start preparing our communities and our hospitals better. And then as like the hotspots went to like New York, the New York physicians were telling the rest of us and then Louisiana and then, you know, so on and so forth. So that was really helpful a year ago. So if anything, it became a lifeline for all of us. 
Yeah, that, the connection to support piece, I think, is is really key. Um, someone, uh, um, there's been interesting. I'm, I'm kind of keeping a side eye here on the on the chat, and, and one person mentioned uh, just this past year um, that their sleep habit habits have, have worsened due to the lack of kind of that consistent schedule going back to work. And then I think this is really interesting, having to offer consistency and reliability to their clients almost makes it harder, like not having that schedule ourselves. Um, have, you know, I'm curious, you know, things like that. Um, and also even then when, so our schedules are messed up, but then we leave work and the experiences from, you know, from being, you know, from being a provider in a healthcare setting are intense too. Do people in the group talk about um, trouble disconnecting or, you know, I know a lot of times for us at night, like there's definitely been nights where I lay my head down to sleep and I am thinking about my patients. I'm thinking about who I saw that day, what happened, who, you know, who's going to, who I'm going to be seeing tomorrow. Is that common? Does that come up? Do people kind of navigate that some way? Yeah, I, I definitely will answer that. But before I say that, I do want to make a mention that not only was our hours inconsistent, but now our patients had way more time than ever to connect with us and to like tell us what's wrong, because now their works their work system was I mean, most of them that are not in essential services um, were shut down. So they had a lot of time to ask for our services. And so that was another stressor, right? Um, but the other thing is uh, to answer your question is like, what, what do we do when we're having trouble disconnecting? Um, you know, and, and it's not uncommon. So our group is open 24 hours a day. We don't shut it down after 5 p.m. or anything like that. So, uh, and our consistency at night is just as much as the day, partly because we have shift workers and people are up at night. We also span over hundred countries. So there's different time zones. So um, it is not uncommon to have like a very, you know, interactive like night thread of like, hey, I'm having trouble sleeping. I mean, there may not be details of like, hey, this patient's still in my mind or anything like that. But you could see that if anything, we're like buffering, like trying, trying to like get our mind off of whatever we're thinking. Um, so whether it's like lighthearted, like talking about something fun, funny, or discussing, you know, a social issue that has nothing to do with medicine, nothing directly to do with medicine as far as like our patient care. Um, I see that more often, um, but I do also see smaller groups forming um, to tell more of those intimate details. And so for example, I have a group of nine women that we actually talk every single day, like via, chat um and we zoom for a long time during the pandemic we zoomed together every saturday and all of us are different medical specialties but we that would be a time for us to kind of unload all of the trauma that we were experiencing all week um, and all the concern so that was really helpful and I, and I imagine that that was happening in multiple smaller groups not just the ones i was in yeah, and I think I'm, you know, I'm glad that you, you know, you use the T word, right? Trauma. I mean, this has mm -hmm. been, uh, and it's not just this year, right? I, I mean, uh, I think the, you know, having seen that the practice of medicine is is full of potentially traumatic experiences, it, and, but it, you know, it does, and it, you know, the, the expectations for a lot of folks are to sort of be more than human sometimes, um, you know, to to not be to sort of witness our, our patients go through incredible traumas, and yet somehow ourselves not necessarily absorb that. Um, I don't know if that's that's always realistic, but um, it's also you know I'm I'm curious um, you know we talk a lot about sort of stress, but um, what do you hear about the experiences of like just the day to day um, burdens? Like I have a lot of physicians I've worked with who um, and and psychologists and social workers who when they're heading home at night and they should be um, sort of winding down or heading home day whenever their shift is and they're winding down. Um, but actually they're sitting there charting, they're finishing up all their administrative tasks from the day. Um, do you see a lot of that? I, Cause I've got to imagine that kind of stuff also interferes with our ability to sort of start our sloop routine when we feel like we've got to, you know, I'm up until I see people inputting chart notes at like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, oh gosh, um, what is happening there? It's funny. Cause you say 10 o'clock at night and I'm like, that's pretty early. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I think that, you know, and I've been one of those people before, and I mean, now I have a lot more boundaries with work and, um, I happen to actually work at a place. I mean, my, my work situation has changed a little bit as far as the hospitals I work for and the type of work I do now, as you said in my bio, but, um, but I, I do work for a system that gives us an hour after our shift that's paid to chart. So, um, I love that they are taking an active role and saying, you know, hey, you know, like this is not something we want you to take home. You're already taking home your thoughts. 
You don't need to take home your computer. So I love that they do that. Um, and it's amazing when you give, when you give your healthcare workers that time, you know, not only does the work get done, but if you think about it, like why, why are we so, um, I guess, motivated to push our physicians and nurses to get the charting done? Um, and it's because well, one, there's like legal stuff that goes in those charts. Right. But two, it's, you know, it's like the ultimate cash register. It's like, what did you do? What can we bill for? Right. And so let's be honest here. It's a business. So <clears throat> there isn't really a business I know that can get all of that done without investing. And so I think that investing, paying your clinicians charting time, um, even though, you know, I know that there's probably a lot of administrators on here that are like, what is she talking about? Don't say that. <laughs> but at the same time, um, but I'll tell you, the work will get done a lot faster and a lot cleaner. You know, they're not, you know, doing this at night while the kids are, you know, asking them to make a snack or to read them a bedtime story. They're not choosing work over their family. And ultimately, if you want better health care, if you want a better system, then treat your physicians as you want your patients to have that, that care as well. You know what I mean? So I mean, not only physicians, I'm talking about all healthcare workers. So I'm sorry if I'm really physician centric in my wording, um, I don't mean to exclude other healthcare workers, but we're all going through the same experience. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would say, but I will, I will say that it's not uncommon to see threads of like, Hey, how many charts do you have to do? And it'll be like, okay, we'll finish like five charts and then come back and comment. And, you know, so you see like this kind of group charting, marathon going on, you know, in the group. So I've seen that happen, but I, I, but oftentimes there's people in there, especially wellness officers. They're like, "Mm -mm, put it away. Don't normalize this. You know, let's put the onus on the health system. Yeah. And you're actually queuing us up, uh, Dr. Seisler, our, our, our other uh, guest here. We're going to start talking about the systems in just a moment because I think there's a lot to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, but other folks, you know, folks in the audience, I think, you know, they're resonating. They're, they're coming. That's trauma-informed care right there. And that's a great point from Carrie. You know, a lot of what we're talking about of, um, of, of sort of treating people in humane ways, of, of giving options and flexibility. Um, it's the same stuff we would do for our patients, but we don't often talk about it for ourselves. Um, you know, we had another person mention, um, yeah, realizing like the sort of um, our own mental shift of realizing like the business will still be there, the hospital, the clinic will still be there without us for that night. Um, you know, it's not only the public who sort of, especially this past year, has like deemed everyone heroes. We take some of that on ourselves, whether it's the burden of heroism or just you know the responsibilities of it, and it can feel like you know we're our patients' whole world. I mean, they may not think that, but it feels that way sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I coach on legacy. I think it's a really important topic is legacy mindset, like really living a values-based life. And um, for some, for a lot of people, that's a kind of a new concept. Um, but legacy is like really the, the foundation for any great business or community, um, really. But I will say that, you know, I always joke, like on my obituary, I hope it never says like she was really great at charting like she got it in on time um I would rather it say other things like maybe like I was an amazing mom because I read to my kids every night or like whatever it may be you know so so I mean and the reality is like if I or any of us died today like we would be replaced the the business would go on and so why do we kill ourselves for the business I'm not sure uh, yeah, and there's more. I'm seeing the chat kind of lighting up on this one too. Yeah. Um, you know, Dr. Sabri, I, I um, um, I'm, I'm gonna sort of um start to wrap up our conversation. Yeah, yeah, sure. I want to bring on Dr. Seisler, but um, can folks find out more? I mean, so I like again, I've been just totally blown away. The, the more I learn about physician mom group, and, and like you said, there it's a it's actually a pretty diverse and diversifying audience who are involved. I think um, there are other places where you suggest folks can go to because I think there is so much power in acknowledging what's going on and talking to people understand. Um... Yeah. So, um, I mean, for Physician Moms Group, we have a website. It's mypmg.com. And um, we have a blog there that's gaining a little bit more momentum now that the pandemic is a little bit more controlled in our aspects. So we're able to put a little bit more information out there. And the whole point of us putting information out there is that there's such valuable content in, in the group. Um, but it is like kind of 
blocked by cyber walls. Like, you know, the public can't get in there, you know, and we're pretty stringent about our membership. Um, and so what we wanted to do is really elevate the voices and the brilliance of our members. So we do have a blog, but there's tons of blogs out there um, for, I mean, I'm sure most of you know, Kevin MD, um, he does great work on elevating physician voices, um, not only physician voices, uh, you know, all healthcare workers, like you can submit for his blog as well. Um, and they talk a lot about mental health and burnout and the importance of self-care. Um, but I think ultimately, I think my I think my one piece of advice, I don't know if this is really a resource, but one of the things that I hope changes, and if any of you guys are decision makers in your institution, um, that that wellness not just be a title that someone puts on their door and maybe gets a stipend. Um, I've been offered chief wellness officer roles, uh, one role, uh, it's not multiple, one time. And, um, and I didn't take it because you can't really, make that role successful if you're not given the resources and, and, and the decision-making process to actually help those that you're serving. And so I just really would think about the word wellness. I actually don't like using that word at all because I feel like it's lost its meaning um, and it's a little bit fake in a way, but I, I would just ask you guys to really challenge your institutions of like, what can we do? Even if it costs a little bit of money, even if it takes a little bit of time, that really physicians, healthcare workers will give you back tenfold. So that's something that I'm really passionate about talking about, whether it's speaking at your institution, um, coaching, you know, executives, especially ones that have want to increase the number of women at their um, institution. There's a lot of benefits as to why to do that. Um, but ultimately just learning how to be more I don't know, uh, healthcare friendly, if anything. So I think it's super important. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you, Andrew. And doing anything with you is amazing. So um, I just, I've been following you for the last year. And so it's been fun just to see, you know, all of the advocacy you do. So thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate it. And if you have a few minutes, we'd love, there's um, we've got a lot of folks in the chat. Feel free to keep it going there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you, Dr. Sabri. And, and thank sure. you for all the work that you've been doing. Um, yeah. So uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, our, uh, our second guest here, um, uh, Dr. Charles Seisler. Uh, Dr. Seisler co-founded and directs the Division of Sleep Medicine at Harvard Medical School, where he's the Frank Baldino Jr. PhD Professor of Sleep Medicine and a Professor of Medicine. He teaches three undergraduate courses at Harvard College and is the founding chief of the Division of Sleep and Circadian Disorders at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Seisler discovered that sleep resets the brain circadian clock in humans, even in some totally blind people, and that light can be used effectively to treat maladaption to night shift work. He discovered that the brain circadian clock regulates sleep during uh, duration and structure. And he's also applied his research to improve, improve shift work schedules, which is super relevant here. Uh, he characterized fundamental properties of the human circadian pacemaker, including the intrinsic period. He discovered that melatonin can improve misaligned sleep, demonstrated that physicians' extended duration work shifts adversely affect both patient and physician safety. And he demonstrated clinical trials, uh, he designed the clinical trials leading to all three FDA approved treatments for circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders. Dr. Seisler directs the largest National Institute of Health supported sleep and circadian research training program in the nation. And this is just cool. He led NASA's sleep team, recording the sleep of astronauts, including Senator John Glenn during space flight. With his colleagues, he received NASA's Innovation Award for designing the recently installed solid state lighting system on the International Space Station to improve the sleep of astronauts. Uh, that is just so cool, Dr. Seisler. Uh, Welcome, really honored to have you. Um, we've actually been talking about many of the concepts um, that you've influenced in, and, and even discovered here in this past year's series. So this is such a great way to, to tie things up. Um, you know, you've, uh, I, I was introduced to you uh, at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so, um, you know, we really appreciate that. And part of the discussion came from your historical involvement in the sleep health of healthcare providers, of medical residents, um, in a really big way. Um, so I'd love to hear your perspective in terms of uh, the systems that impact sleep for healthcare providers. Um, and maybe you can start, um, and I know you, you have some slides to share as well. How did we get here? How, how did we get to a state where 
um, sleep is so hard to come by for healthcare providers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philip. And I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Sabri's presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and I, I, was, I was reflecting on, on, uh, on what she was sharing with us. And uh, I was really enjoying it so much that uh, it's, it's a bit of a shock to be now speaking again. But um, I wanted to say, first of all, that I'm going to be talking about resident physicians as sort of a case study, kind of a microcosm of what we're talking about. But it really extends to all healthcare workers, uh, as Hala so um, eloquently uh, shared with us. So not only physicians, but nurses, physicians assistants, paramedics, EMS service providers, first responders. Uh, even when I was, uh, I remember when I was an undergraduate, and Halo made me think of this, um, and I volunteered to be part of uh, what, what was called Room 13 at Harvard College, which, which was a peer counseling and drop-in center. Uh, and we essentially would work like 36-hour shifts because we would be in class beforehand, then we would be up all night on our shifts for like 12 hours, and then we would go back to class the next day. And uh, I did the same thing when I was doing my undergraduate uh, thesis project on circadian rhythms, working 36 hour shifts. And, you know, we thought nothing of it because there was, you know, I, I even when I would be feeling terrible and exhausted and, and uh, making mistakes and so on, I would realize, I would, I would think to myself, well, if, if I want to be a physician, this is what physicians normally do. Hundreds of thousands of people do that. Everybody who is trained does it. And so I've just got to sort of, you know, buck up and get it done. And, and it was an expectation that, that uh, sleep deprivation is almost a badge of honor uh, and that we have to train ourselves to be able to do it. And what I'm going to describe to you today is that we really, we really need a cultural shift here. And so that's why I think it's good to go back to the history of how all of this started. And I'm glad you asked that question. <clears throat> and so uh, if, we, if we look back to the history, uh, we, it turns out that, that uh, about a century ago, more than a century ago, uh, and this is a photograph of William Stuart Halstead performing surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1904. It was sort of set in stone that, uh, that, the, that, that residents would be working day and night. Uh, and that comes from the program that Dr. Halstead founded at Johns Hopkins in the 1890s. And he wanted residents to literally dedicate their lives to the profession. That's why he had them living and staying in the hospital. They only got a few days off uh, per year. He had you know, barbers come in to cut their hair uh, because he he uh, and he he discouraged them from getting married because he wanted to give he wanted to give their all to the profession uh, during their training. So how was he? And he was renowned for working extended duration uh, shifts and staying up all night and whatnot. What people didn't know at the time was that he was a cocaine addict, and that's how he was able to do so. Uh, he had been discharged. He, he, he was in an inpatient treatment facility for two years at the Bradley Hospital in Rhode Island, trying to get him off of cocaine, which he, uh, when the New England Journal revealed all of this about 15 years ago, they called him an accidental addict because uh, he was testing cocaine as a surgical anesthetic when he became addicted to it. And they tried to get him off of cocaine by using morphine, and he ended up, when he was discharged uh, after two years in this inpatient facility, being addicted to both. Um, and so he had sort of what the Air Force would call a go pill, and then he had the no-go pills. Uh, and, uh, and he really didn't, didn't ever shed that addiction, uh, it, it would appear, from, from the uh, uh, records that are available. And um, yet he had international renown as one of the greatest surgeons uh, who ever lived and, and one who established our training program and really established this notion uh, that we should work for these extended duration shifts. And yet, and so you, know, you might think, well, nobody realized it was dangerous. But uh, actually this year is the 50th anniversary of uh, a landmark publication in the New England Journal of medicine uh, showing that when residents worked these extended duration shifts and stayed up all night, 
uh, that they made nearly twice as many errors at detecting cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, reading that 50-year-old article, uh, in the discussion, they talk about the adverse psychological effects on the trainees themselves, which I thought was particularly relevant to your question about what about us. Uh, they were having perceptual distortions, temporal disorganization, memory impairment, uh, difficulty concentrating. And, and it's, it's no wonder because uh, the brain without sleep, certain regions of the brain, particularly the prefrontal cortex that exhibits judgment, uh, that's responsible for judgment and control, and some sensory er areas of the brain are really, they, they just don't have enough glucose at a certain point to fuel the functions of those areas of the brain. And we are just as impaired after 24 hours without sleep as if we had a blood alcohol concentration of 0.1%, uh, in other words, legally drunk in terms of our reaction time uh, and so on. And interestingly, in that same article from 50 years ago, uh, they recognized that not only were they experiencing difficulties of thinking, but also depression, depersonalization, which is central to burnout, uh, and various other inappropriate affect, et cetera. Um, and uh, they, they talk about these negative mood changes and transient psychopathology that may interfere with their functioning. And so, uh, and what did the medical profession do? This, this, this notion that they should be living in the hospital was so entrenched that they simply said, well, maybe instead of having them work 36 hours on and 12 hours off, um, maybe we should give them one additional day so that they would work a 36 hour shift, go home and then come back and work a 12 hour shift and then go home and then come back and then work a 36 hour shift. In other words, they changed the system so that instead of every single shift being 36 hours long, it was every other shift would be 36 hours long. So they really did not lance the, the, the source of the problem. They just reduced the frequency with which it occurred. Now, it's kind of amazing uh, that this system has persisted for as long as it, as, it, as it does, because it's really common knowledge. In fact, our research, Senator Proxmire tried to give us this sort of the Golden Fleece Award when we were doing our studies, uh, because uh, to him it was a complete waste of time uh, that we were that we were studying this because it's so obvious that people would be impaired by sleep deprivation. Uh, in fact, only 1% of Americans approve of doctors caring for patients for more than 24 consecutive hours. 95%, and this is uh, uh, Republicans, Democrats, one of the few things that you know, we are united in as a country is that healthcare providers should not be working these extended duration shifts. Uh, unfortunately, that view is not shared by those who run the healthcare system in the United States, or at least many of those who run it. And this is the cultural change that needs to happen. I mean, I, I was shocked when we got a review back from that paper when we submitted for, for publication that said, what does it matter if patients disapprove? Uh, what does it matter if patients disapprove of the doctor's work hours? What does it matter what patients think? Um, which, you know, flies in the face of all of our, uh, you know, patient autonomy for their health care, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of the, of the ethics of, of treating patients. Uh, we published a series of articles in 2004 and 5 showing that, really unequivocally, that, that patient care was endangered when people worked these extended duration shifts. Uh, the residents had more attentional failures at night. They made more serious medical errors and serious diagnostic errors. Uh, they crashed their cars more often when they drove home from these extended duration shifts. They stabbed themselves with needles or scalpels uh, uh, much more often. And uh, we were, you know, one of the responses to this well was, well, that's because they're inexperienced. Experienced doctors would not have this problem. So we did another study in which we showed that, that, uh, that attending surgeons uh, that there was a 170% increased risk of a serious complication if the attending surgeon had had less than six hours of sleep uh, in between cases on a, on a uh, night that they were on call before an elective surgical procedure. So even our faculty were sensitive to the impact of, uh, of sleep deprivation. 
this led me to, to write a, a, a perspective piece in the New England Journal in which I suggested to the horror of, uh, of the attending physicians and, and surgeons around the country that they should actually ask their patients for permission, uh, disclose to the patients if they had been up all night prior to an elective surgical procedure. So we're not talking about an emergency, but somebody comes, who comes in for, uh, for a procedure that, is, that they've been thinking about, trying to decide whether to get for maybe a year beforehand, and then they come into the doctor, okay, I'm gonna have this done next Monday, not realizing uh, that the doctor may have been up all night the previous day. And uh, uh, the American College of Surgeons, the, the various other groups uh, uh, were uh, serious, severely objected to this uh, suggestion and said uh, that patients should not be informed and that the doctor should decide whether they're fit to do so. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine uh, disagreed and said that when resident physicians are up for more than 16 consecutive hours that it endangers not only patient safety, but also the safety and health of the resident physicians. Uh, and they wrote a report in 2009 saying that, that, uh, that the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Edu Education should limit the work hours to no more than 16 consecutive hours. And uh, <clears throat> that then when they work those uh, longer shifts, if it were required for an emergency or whatnot, that they have increased duration of time off after those shifts to recover. Now, the National Academy of Medicine, when they made that, uh, when they wrote that report, said that uh, this would cost an additional $1.7 billion a year. Uh, Medicare right now pays $10 billion a year to support the resident physician salaries uh, of all the resident physicians throughout the United States. Um, and Medicare alone does that, the other health insurers do not uh, participate. And they said that it would need an infusion of additional $1.7 billion to uh, about 9% of the cost of what they were paying uh, to avoid a dangerous increase in workload if the work hours were reduced. And um, so, uh, you know, Andrew, you asked me what sort of system changes could be made and that investment was never made, sadly. In fact, it took two years for the Accreditation Council of Grad Graduate Medical Education to finally respond to the National Academy of Medicine. And they uh, set up a set of restrictions, which only limited the work hours of first year resident physicians. Uh, and they didn't limit the work hours of the 84,000 uh, residents who were in their second or third or, or higher years. And uh, those limits were in place for six years before they were rescinded on July 1st, 2017. So there was a big fanfare when the limits were put in place. Uh, and there was hardly a mention when the work hours were again allowed to go up to 28 hour shifts, which happened uh, uh, nearly four years ago. And um, what we did was we looked at the impact during those six years uh, of the uh, limits on uh, resident physician work hours. Um, and what we found was that the number of medical errors was significant, the risk of medical errors uh, was significantly reduced during that interval as compared to, um, <clears throat> as compared to beforehand. Uh, the risk of preventable adverse events and fatal uh, preventable adverse events was down by 60%. That's in terms of patient safety. And then in terms of resident physician safety, there was an, also an association during that time interval when the work hours reduced with a reduced risk of attentional failures, motor vehicle crashes, near crashes, and percutaneous injuries were cut almost in half. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, those limits have now been rescinded. Uh, we have done a study recently uh, to look at uh, the resident physician work hours uh, and what happens when we introduce such a schedule without the funding necessary to prevent increased workload. And what we found was that the effectiveness of limiting work hours to no more than 16 consecutive hours depended on the number of ICU patients per resident physician. So when the unit had uh, an average of five resident 
to five patients, intensive care unit patients per resident physician. Then decreasing uh, the work hours resulted in nearly 75% reduction in, uh, in the number of, uh, of adverse events, the relative risk for uh, a resident physician related serious medical error. But if they had 14 patients per resident physician, ICU patients, it's, it's hard to even think of them as being in an intensive care unit. They can only spend four or five minutes per, uh, per child. These are pediatric intensive care units uh, per hour. Um, but there were some uh, facilities in our, in our study where they were operating at that level. And the, and the workload increased by about 25% when we reduced the resident physician work hours. And when that happened, the risk of a serious medical error actually increased. Uh, it makes me think of the Lucille Ball, uh, you know, chocolate, uh, the, the, when, when she was on the assembly line with the chocolates. And at a certain point, if you, if you increase the rate at which you're trying to do the work, uh, there's just no way of getting it done safely. When we adjusted for uh, workload, we found that the risk of a serious medical error by reducing the work hours was decreased by nearly 50%, but, the, but overall it increased if, if you didn't control for workload. So I just wanna put this in perspective um, because in, in every area that we've looked at in the healthcare profession, the push is in the reverse direction. We, we have paramedics who are, uh, and, and, and uh, um, emergency medical uh, services team members who are, who, for, for whom the norm is 24, 48, even 72 hour shifts. Uh, we've even seen in Los Angeles, 96 hour shifts uh, within those professions going out every hour on calls. Um, and basically every area that we look within the healthcare profession is, is somehow teeming with this notion, this macho notion that you should be able to do these, uh, and I think the, these long shifts. And I think it's related to the fact that in an emergency, I mean, the most common question that I used to get is, well, yes, but if 9-11 happens, don't we have to be able to throw ourselves into the, into the breach and help? Or if we have a pandemic, yes, under certain circumstances, we have to respond in crisis mode. But that doesn't mean that that's the mode that we should be in uh, because all the time, because we'll never have the resilience to deal with an emergency. Uh, in 1948, the uh, United States voted together with many other nations to adopt the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which assures that everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitations of work hours. Uh, and I would, I would submit that working 24 hours shifts is not a reasonable limitation of work hours. In uh, 2011, an, arbitration, an arbitrator in Quebec found that working 24-hour shifts violates the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and declared that it also uh, contravened the Canadian uh, uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms and said that, um, and, and, and thereby ruled that in, in Quebec at least, uh, these kinds of shifts uh, would no longer be allowed. Uh, the same thing happened uh, 30 years ago in uh, New Zealand, which has not allowed extended duration shifts. In 2003, the European Working Time Directive uh, ruled that um, rest of at least 11 hours in every 24 hours had to be provided to every worker, including healthcare workers. And I think these are the kinds of changes that need to be made uh, because sleep does matter. We have a whole program at the Brigham Women's Hospital where we provide sleep health education and sleep disorders screening for healthcare providers and healthcare provider organizations. Um, and uh, about 25 to 30% of all healthcare providers have, we have found, have some type of sleep disorder, either chronic insomnia or uh, sleep apnea. And so it is an important thing to address because that, you know, if you have a sleep disorder and you're being required to work extended duration shifts, it can really be a recipe for uh, grave uh, adverse events. Yeah, so, and, you know, just thank you, Dr. Phillips, for the opportunity to share some of these perspectives. And yeah, uh, yeah happy to answer any of your other questions. Yeah, I've got a lot. I mean, gosh, that and and we've had some uh, some reactions from the audience, that, and I think in for some folks it. it it brings up some anger, you know, even hearing about the, you know, the history here, 
Um, and it makes so much sense. Like, you know, I appreciated how you kind of started with some of the, you know, the earlier history, you know, we have like truly a culture of like, literally don't ever leave work. Like this is, this is what you were built for. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, um, we, we have a, you know, uh, particularly, um, you know, folks who, who tend to, who have been coming to the series this year, um, a lot of us are really dedicated to, um, to ensuring care for safety net populations, for vulnerable communities, for those who tend to be um, underserved to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you seen there? Like, it, it, are we all sort of created equally um, um, when it comes to the impacts of sleep health for healthcare providers? Does it, does it hit certain groups differently? Well, uh, that's a great question, Andrew. Both healthcare providers, first of all, underserved communities um, tend to have uh, the t- tend to be populated by people who are often chronically sleep deprived. And why is that? So people <clears throat> who are in underserved communities are often uh, themselves disadvantaged. And those individuals uh, who are underrepresented minorities or in other ways economically disadvantaged tend to have jobs uh, that require, and we've seen this during the pandemic, uh, the essential service providers. Uh, And often they work uh, very difficult hours themselves. And so they are at much higher risk of sleep disorders. Uh, They have a higher rate of obesity, which is not only associated with the fact that they're living in food deserts, but also uh, the fact that their that chronic sleep deficiency impairs uh, uh, metabolism and increases appetite and increases the risk of obesity. Uh, somehow, appetite and, and sleep deprivation uh, got linked somewhere in evolution. So, so uh, because animals don't sleep deprive themselves unless they are starving, and so there are endocrine changes that happen when we sleep deprive ourselves, even if we're not starving, that puts the brain in starvation mode. So we become ravenously hungry and are not satisfied with what we eat because of these endocrine changes. And um, so, and that leads to higher risk of sleep apnea. So it, it becomes a little bit of a vicious circle. So the population is, is suffering from more sleep related disorders. Then the providers working in those areas uh, are often in under resourced institutions, which further creates a situation where the, the limited providers who are available are then working extended duration hours. Uh, and, and often the, the hospitals that have the worst schedules for the trainees are often in underserved areas. Uh, and so, and, and they will tend to get, uh, they will tend to get foreign medical graduates who cannot get uh, an internship or residency in a hospital with a better schedule. And again, they come into our system and it's just sort of normative within our system that they're working these extended duration shifts. There was a tragic case in Chicago where where a a foreign medical graduate in her third week in the United States uh, working these 36 hour shifts uh, fell asleep at the wheel and uh, and seriously injured uh, a young uh, graduate student who um, who uh, suffered severe brain damage uh, as a result of the accident um, and um, and unfortunately the hospital where she worked in Chicago I said that it was all her fault that is to say the trainee's fault uh, and that the hospital should bear no responsibility for having scheduled her to work that schedule. And unfortunately, the, the Illinois Supreme Court agreed. And so, uh, so <laughs> one of the things that healthcare providers have to realize is that the institution will not stand behind you in most cases, even if they have, uh, they have degraded your performance such that you might commit an act like falling asleep at the wheel that leaves you financially responsible for um, the rest of your life garnering your wages to care for someone who is disabled. You know, it's, it's, it's I mean, for, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's not very heartening hearing about that, unfortunately, but it does line up with so much of, you know, throughout the year and, and, and before, you know, we, we've talked about, 
we've talked about inequity and disparities. And one of the key um, themes that's come up is, you know, we need more representative people serving patients. Like, you know, we know that care tends to be better and better received when the person taking care of you looks and speaks and sounds like you. Um, and yet, you know, so, so you know, we're, our PCDC, we're located in, in, in New York City, although we do national work and, you know, we work with a lot of folks here in, in the Bronx and in other areas. And um, yeah, like it's been, it's been great to see many of the healthcare trainees and, and early um, healthcare professionals are much more diverse, uh, you know, certainly recently than they've been before. Um, and yet there's earlier at the very beginning of the series, we actually had a, another um, NIH funded researcher who shared her research around um, disparities of, um, of young black women who experiencing discrimination stress and that direct impact on the quality of their sleep each night. So I think about that, but then I also think about what Dr. Sabri was talking about earlier of, of, being, of being a parent, of being a mom, of having other responsibilities. And, and then I think about what you mentioned earlier of the expectation of being sort of working for 24 hours straight I can only imagine the combination of these things, you know, of coming from a background where you may not have privilege uh, of having people to take care of your family or, or having, um, you know, the, the backing to essentially to work 24 seven of already having um, uh, greater obstacles to healthy sleep and, and, you know, in general health, and you mentioned the food deserts and things like that. And then dealing with things like discrimination now on top of all that, Holy cow! I mean, I'm even as you're talking, I'm putting these things together. It's incredible. I know it's 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 very sad. By the way, the Bronx has a special place in my heart since I did some of my doctoral dissertation research at Mount Ephraim Hospital there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it it is uh, it is very disheartening. And and you know, I, I noticed uh, uh, Dr. Sabri that you're an emergency medicine physician. Um, and one of the things that I'm uh, proudest of uh, is that in uh, 1985 and 1986, as the as the Association of Emergency Medicine Physicians was being formed, uh, they somehow somebody knew me in that group, and they asked me to come and give a talk at their, one of their first organizational meetings. And the big question was, what sort of work schedules should we try to establish? And I said, please, I begged them not to do the 24-hour shifts and to have a maximum work limit of 12 hours. I said, there's no possible justification in terms of continuity of care or any other argument that was being used at the time for these 24-hour shifts. And so they set it as a standard. And once you do that cultural change, I mean, that, that was possible there because there was no history prior to that. Once you set the, the, the cultural standard, uh, is it not the case, Dr. Savory, that, that in general, uh, emergency physicians don't work more than 12 hours? Yeah, so my dad was actually emergency medicine in the 80s and 90s, and I remember him going to work for 24 hours. Some of uh, my older colleagues that were working at right. that time remember 36 hours. Right, that was gonna be the norm. Yeah, and there was this be. meeting on Cape Cod and I presented there and I implored them and they just said, okay, they set the standard at 12 hours. And then once it becomes a standard, then if hospitals deviate from it, they're at greater risk for malpractice and other things. And so that became the standard in emergency medicine. There's no reason that that can't be the standard in other areas, except for this quote unquote tradition, which is, first of all, it makes no sense anyway, because at the time that that so-called tradition was established, the hospitals didn't do much at night. They, uh, they didn't have labs open 24 hours. They didn't have intensive care units. So we've kept a tradition from the past in which the doctors were able to sleep during much of the night, even if they lived in the hospital. Uh, my dad said, you know, once in a while they would, they would wake him up uh, if the patient died, to declare the patient dead or whatever. But uh, there wasn't much that could be done, and therefore the doctors were not up continuously. So we've kept a tradition from a distant past in terms of the work schedule, but the workload has dramatically increased because they don't sleep at all. They sleep like an average of like 1.5 hours per 36-hour shift when they're on. So there's, uh, and many of the times they're up all night. And so there's just no justification anymore for this kind of, uh, brutalizing uh, work schedule, which has like 85% of the residents burned out by the time they finished their first year. Yeah, it was, it was striking what you had mentioned earlier um, about um, 
the early, early studies finding the psychological impact of sleep deprivation, and we've connected that to burnout as well, and also depression. And, and gosh, I mean, this is, you know, we still read about these things now. You know, there, there was a... And, and by the way, when they yeah. become burned out, I just want to say, it increases by sixfold, that's 500% increase, their risk of an error when they're, when they're burned out and depressed. So why would, it, it's not helping our, any aspect of our system. And so then you have patients in underserved areas who are coming in, being taken care of by depressed, often frustrated, angry uh, healthcare providers who are just exasperated by what they're being asked to do. I want to I want to take us into um, you know and we we've got another fifteen minutes or so I I want to get back to the solutions because you know I, I think um, you know we we also have a lot of healthcare leaders here and and you know I certainly work with folks who are um, you know health health plan and health system executives and and policymakers uh, you know I'm sure there sure, surely there's exceptions but most people that I've I've come across in in the that kind of like um, decision making space. Um, I think they're good people. You know, they, they're, they're um, you know, we all, nope, neither them nor me nor any of us want to sort of, um, you know, be under the blade of someone who is sleep deprived. Like it, it doesn't work well for anybody. And one of the, one, Susan in the audience even asked um, about some of the research you had done, if there was any sort of, um, like if we decrease medical errors or are there are there cost savings, is there some sort of like, you know, way that we can justify this? Like, you know, we have decision makers here. Um, you mentioned twelve-hour shifts. Are, are there other, other things we can we can do, even on an individual basis? Well, one thing that we can do is to uh, I, I think sleep health education and sleep disorder screening are two really crucial uh, tools that we can use because I have found that once we share information with people, and 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 as you say, uh, I think uh, administrators and other decision makers if they are provided with the knowledge and the understanding and the recognition that it is self-defeating to schedule the uh, physicians to work these kinds of schedules. And, and, you know, they have to develop policies because sometimes like airplane pilots, like, uh, like uh, firefighters, people will try to pack in their hours to the shortest period of time. Uh, well, I work 48 hours straight. Or I'll work 96 hours straight and I'll only work every two weeks. That gives me 10 days off. Every, you know, I basically, I get a vacation every two weeks. People will often, unfortunately, choose schedules that may not be safe for themselves or for the people for whom they're caring, um, either for economic reasons, because they get overtime in some situations, or uh, for reasons in the medical uh, profession where they, where they may feel that they... Um, you know, they, they, they'll miss out on training opportunities or they won't see, used to be a saying, if I'm only there every other night, I'll miss half the good cases. Um, so there can be many different motivations uh, that either that people have or they're indoctrinated to believe will be important in pressing their, their, uh, their the people who are the training directors. And in that regard, Dr. Sabri, you know, you were saying that the only way to model for your children is to adopt good behaviors yourself, right? And so, not the only way, but probably the most the efficient way I found with ways. my N of five, my yeah. N of five. <laughs> yeah, one of the best ways. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that's the same way that we, we have to, you know, that's the approach that we need to have in the medical profession for training the next generation. The good news is that fewer, and even though the Accreditation Council of Grad, Graduate Medical Education has lifted the restriction uh, on work hours, the, the prevalence of extended duration work shifts has dropped dramatically among training programs in the United States. And so uh, I think the, there is a cultural change that has happened. Uh, and those kinds of uh, people are not choosing to uh, uh, to apply to residency programs that have, uh, you know, the shifts where they're working every other shift is 30, 30 hours long. And um, they're also, uh, as, as a consequence, there are fewer such programs. And even when we look at the, at the programs that were led by uh, at, at institutions that, that were fighting uh, most vigorously against any kind of limits, uh, only a small fraction of their uh, trainees, um, uh, just a few uh, rotations are now working those shifts. 
So I think that there, uh, even though the policymakers in Chicago at the AMA and the ACGME and the, uh, and the various American College of Surgeons, even though they may not have changed their position, there's been a cultural change in the United States. So I think that that's the first step. Um, and I remember uh, the CEO of our hospital when, when we were first starting, starting to apply for these studies, uh, when the government first announced the uh, uh, request for proposals related to work hours, um, uh, Mr. Jeff Outen said to me, who was our CEO at the time, he said, uh, promise me, Chuck, that you'll do the study even if you don't get the grant award. And I was kind of shocked, but he himself realized uh, uh, that, and, and, and maybe it's because he had the perspective of not being a physician, which, uh, um, that that he that he said you know th these these schedules are barbaric we you know you have to collect some data to prove that uh, you know the damage that it's doing to our uh, providers and our patients and of course I was surprised by the magnitude of the because I was indoctrinated myself about these schedules and, and presumed that they must be safe since you know it's kind of like the the old commercials about. Uh, uh, cigarettes, you know, my, my doctor prefers this brand and whatnot. So you think that if doctors do it, it's got to be safe, uh, even though, um, even though that when the uh, Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education studied the impact of working these extended shifts on physicians, they found that it degraded their performance uh, to the seventh to the fifteenth percentile of their arrested performance. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no question from uh, the literature that sleep deprivation adversely affects performance uh, and that it adversely affects health. And now we just have to implement that into policies. Yeah, I mean, it is, it, you know, it's encouraging to hear that, um, that some, uh, and, and, and some folks in the chat had, had iterated, had, had made some comments around this too. Um, some of the change isn't necessarily coming from uh, administration or or the, or the policies. It's coming from cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. You know that the fact that um, you know if, if residents and other medical and healthcare trainees know now that there's programs that do drive folks into the ground. And I remember going through um, my internship and and, uh, and residency training, and and we knew about it. You know, we you'd you'd hear the reputation of different types of programs that they expect that this is going to be your life and. You know, I remember as, as a as a psychology trainee and going and working in, in hospitals and along with you know along with the physicians and others. I, I remember carting into the parking lot at 3 a.m. and feeling you know I was like and 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 Dr. Saber, this reminds me of what you said earlier about sort of that that achievement drive. It was like it was I remember that feeling of of like this you have to do this. The expectations are so great. There is no way that I could possibly be a competent. Um, healthcare, anything. If I don't demonstrate this level of commitment, I remember, like, I remember walking in there to being the only one in the entire building, the lights flickering at, at two or three yeah. in the morning. And if I could talk to myself back then, I'd be, you know, I, I'd say like, one, that certainly didn't make my patient care any better because I was exhausted. And, and, and two, uh, I don't know that like, it, it didn't, it wasn't necessary, but it feels there's that imperative that, that really feels there. And I, so I think that the emphasis on, on, Early, um, early career folks on, on trainees on training programs, and that really seems like that's where a lot of this starts. Um, and, and you know, even the even the military has now begun to recognize this. So a series of studies have been done at Walter Reed uh, Army Hospital, where they have it was the mentality that, and which was the same thing in the medical profession that that if you have to be able to function in an emergency without sleep then you need to train the troops by sleep depriving them. And finally, the military realized that if you're going to, you know, if, and the, the analogy that I would give is if you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be low on food, you don't get people ready by starving them for several months before they get to that situation, because they're going to have much less resilience to cope with uh, a shortage of food if they're well fed than if they have been starving. So it's the same way with sleep. To have the resilience to deal with uh, a situation where you're not going to be able to get enough sleep, you need to be tanked up on sleep before you get to that situation. And so now the Army has done a whole series of studies in which they have demonstrated that. 
that uh, that soldiers who are chronically sleep deprived before they get into a situation where they have to stay up all night perform worse than if they have been tanked up on sleep beforehand uh, by spending nine to 10 hours a night in bed and then facing a situation where they uh, have to stay up all night. So there's a sort of a paradigm shift in the recognition that, that it, it actually, uh, a sleep deprived, chronically sleep deprived soldier is not as great of an asset in the military as one who is well rested. And we need to adopt the same mentality uh, in the medical field that uh, in our training, uh, you know, we, again, and this is something that has been uh, learned in the last 25 years, that uh, sleep is a critical um, uh, part of memory consolidation. And so if you practice and train on something during the daytime, then it's during sleep that you consolidate that memory uh, and your performance is about 20% faster and your recall is better after that night of sleep, even without any further training. And so, uh, you know, when surgeons ask me, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, is this gonna extend the length of my surgical training program if I uh, do not work all of these 36 hour shifts? And my response to that, and it's usually irritating to people is that, um, Maybe that's why it takes seven years because you keep sleep depriving yourself after you've learned something. And so you have to learn it again and again. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes so much sense. And, you know, I do hope, you know, this, um, you know, as I said, when I, as we did the introduction today, you know, one of the things I mentioned was, you know, this is, this series is part of a broader initiative around integrated care and, and, and bringing together a, a truly inter multidisciplinary, even transdisciplinary perspectives. And, you know, I think, and what we're talking about, we're, we're talking like, we're talking about hard medical facts. We're talking about human behavior. We're talking about the sort of intersection of, of psychosocial needs. I mean, I hope that, you know, as our professional areas continue to commingle, we can reinforce these things. So it sounds like we all need to kind of carry the same message. And, you know, we all probably have a part in reinforcing this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna take us through a few final messages here. And, and um, if you're both able to stay on for a couple minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you in just a second for some parting remarks. But um, uh, Kimmy, if you don't mind bringing back up our slides here, I just wanted to, you know, again, this is, um, you know, we're at the conclusion of, of, this, of this entire year long initiative. Um, and, you know, this brings us to the end of our series. And so, you know, before we get to the very last minute, I just, I wanna thank you, I wanna thank the over 2,000 people from across the globe that have tuned in this year for our series. Um, and I hope that, you know, in the chat here, as folks are bringing up questions, also share what are your plans for sleep health um, for yourself or, or for the patients that you serve, either based on what you've heard today or if you've joined other episodes there. Um, and of course, nothing's truly over. Uh, so, you know, just as, just as Dr. Sabre's work and Dr. Seisler's work will continue on, um, we'll continue to provide resources. Um, you know, the, the SAMHSA Center of Excellence and Primary Care Development Corporation, um, we have free resources available. You can check out this full series and others at pcdc.org or pcdc.org slash sleep um, for the sleep series. Uh, the today's will be posted in just the next few days. Also keep your eye on your inbox uh, for more sleep related information. Uh, I just really want to extend a huge thank you to the National Council for Behavioral Health, the SAMHSA Center of Excellence, um, our friends who have um, helped so much this past year at various institutions. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the National Institutes of Health, the National Sleep Foundation, uh, Columbia University, C3, Henry J. Austin, FQHC, the American Sleep Apnea Association, Valor Health Center out in Idaho, Fordham, and so many more. Um, and, and actually, uh, if you'll go to the next slide there, um, I'm also especially thankful um, to some of our behind the scenes production leads here, uh, Kristen and Chaim, they've worked um, uh, also throughout the night, unfortunately, uh, throughout this entire year to make this series a success. So I wanna thank them too. And of course you and the audience. Um, so again, we'll, we'll continue this discussion and actually I'll, I'll um, I'll, I'll tease that we're going to have some some more national discussions um, as we come out of this series, um, you know. But I encourage folks to stay tuned. Um, Dr. Sizer, you have also put in a, a resource here. Maybe you can just mention that as well. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's the UnderstandingSleep.org website where you can learn about sleep health education. 
Uh, and then there's the, I put in the web, in the chat earlier, uh, the Sleep Matters initiative that we have at the Brigham Women's Hospital to help healthcare organizations uh, to address the issue of uh, both sleep health education and sleep disorder screening. And one thing I would say just in closing is that, uh, is that addressing issues related to sleep health can really provide uh, a, a tremendous leg up to, to helping to serve particularly underserved communities uh, and uh, also uh, to healthcare organizations that are, that are trying to cope with the pandemic. We know that, uh, that adverse, adverse mental health consequences of the pandemic have been uh, particularly severe, and I'll, and I'll put in the chat uh, some research that we've done on that as well. Um, but uh, I think that in order for us to have the resilience that we need, both in terms of our immune system, because we only have half the antibody response uh, to a vaccine if we have been chronically sleep deprived before or after getting the vaccine. So it's really important for those of you who are about to get vaccinated uh, to get the sleep that you need. And we also are uh, two or three hundred percent increased risk uh, of of getting a disease like uh, the common cold when we're exposed to the rhinovirus when we are inadequately when we have a sleep deficient. So to keep us all healthy, uh, uh, I suggest that we uh, pay more attention to sleep, and it's it's low hanging fruit to get us through these these difficult times. Absolutely. Dr. Sabri, um, anything else that you'd like to share with us? Any any other um, um, any parting remarks? Gosh, that was so good. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I just, I'm just so impressed with all of the knowledge, the evidence-based medicine um, that was presented and just all of the discussion in the chat, just hearing everybody's experience, it seems like we're all in this together and I'm hoping that this conversation continues. I know this is the last in the series, but I think it's the first um, in a lot of, in a lot of ways for our lives. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and and I, and I love that point. You know, we really are. Although we're not all impacted the same, we're certainly all in it. Um, and and again, none of us are immune to these things. And and we spend uh, starting this year off. It was you know sort of a um, uh, for a lot of us an unusual conversation to really spend an entire year focusing on sleep. Probably you know, so not not for you all. Uh, this is the, the world that you swim in. But um, kind of in in the national health community, we just we don't talk about it a lot. And it's it's. And yet, Dr. So you mentioned it's low hanging fruit. It's right there. Sleep is the intersection between physical health, between behavioral and mental health, between uh, uh, success in our interventions, between our interpersonal uh, you know, interactions, the efficacy of the vaccines that we're talking about. It's everywhere. And it's not the first thing that comes up in the visit. It's not the first thing we talk about, but maybe it should be. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with that, and and I think that it's 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 an issue that is often dealt with as an afterthought, uh, and and the people are ashamed to admit that they have a problem with it. But when we provide healthcare providers with uh, sleep health education and sleep disorder screening, you know, surgeons come up to me, uh, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and say, you know, I never realized that, you know, that and they recognize that they have sleep apnea or some other disorder that we've just shared with them, uh, the symptoms of and so on. And they're like, no wonder uh, uh, I'm suffering the, many of these symptoms. And, and uh, many times once they get a sleep disorder treated, they can get off of some medications that they might've been taking for depression or uh, uh, reduce their medications for diabetes because it really is so, in, it, it plays such an important part in our overall health. Yeah, and that's, I think, and, and uh, I'll also tease, we're gonna, in this coming year, we'll have more conversations on how we take care of ourselves as healthcare providers in general, but I think you know, you're hitting on a big one. I, I mean, there's hesitation, I know, among physicians, but also certainly uh, mental health providers too, around, around seeking care for any of these things, around insomnia, even around sleep, sleep apnea. We worry, will it impact our licenses, our ability to practice? Um, but it should really be just the opposite, right? And we are starting to see some movement, Joint Commission, others sort of encouraging, uh, um, you know, fo folks to to get the care they need. But um, yeah, it's it's right. It's it's not just it's not just um, working twenty four seven that we need to sort of interrupt that cycle. But it's also just closing out health altogether. Um, so you know, we've got yeah. some work to do. But I think these conversations, hopefully, you know, they move us closer to that. 
Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us there. Uh, Dr. Seisler, uh, Dr. Sabri, um, and again, all of our all of our folks who joined us, thank you so much. And to the Center of Excellence for Integrated Health Solutions, um, many of these conversations continue on. So check them out. Um, um, and, and we'll be having hopefully an exciting new year as we enter into the third year of the center. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. Um, so thank you again. This has been a real honor to have this conversation with both of you and with our entire audience here. Um, again, today's recording will be available probably in a couple of days at pcdc.org slash sleep. You'll get an email about it and all of the episodes are there and will stay there for you, your use, for your trainees, for your coworkers, share them. They are free and they are here to help. Um, so again, thank you very much. It has been an honor. Thank you very much.